So thanks to AI, there's a bunch of new buzzwords that have really entered the realm of technology. Now, one term that you very well might have come across recently is called latent space, but that might not be something you have a natural intuitive grasp of yet, especially because the idea of a latent space or a multidimensional space is so wholly unintuitive to the way our brain works, I think it would be worth making a video just to explore. Because that concept is what gives something like ChatGPT its true magic. Also, if you can start to develop some kind of intuition for how data in a higher dimensional space can have relationships that are wholly unimaginable to us, but technically computable, then you also get the base understanding how a lot of different artificial intelligence models actually kind of work under the hood. So let's start with an analogy. Imagine you have a vast library full of every every book that's ever been written. This library is so vast that it's actually impossible to just lay it out in something like alphabetical order or any kind of reasonable way. But now imagine that you have this magical map of the library. But on this map, instead of showing you the location of every book on every shelf, it groups the book by their content, themes, and writing style. So the library represents the higher dimensional space where the data is stored. Any digital information, but we can just imagine images or word fragments like tokens. And this magical map that does the group is what we would call the latent space. And when we use certain types of AI models, like autoencoders or GANs, the generative adversarial models, what they're doing is trying to learn this map. It's a compressed piece of information that describes the much bigger library. But this latent space that we've made, this map, that's all we need most of the time. By navigating around on this magical map, we can actually generate variations of what was learned from the entire library to use. Or sometimes we can find patterns or relationships that are valuable in other ways that we couldn't have seen without the map itself because there was just too much to look through in the full library. A latent space is like a compressed version of everything. It's a map that describes the full detail of the territory. But what's on the map matters because it's essentially the essence or the meaning of what we need. And it's something we can navigate because it's much smaller. So now we have to address the hardest part. If there's anything from this video that you really take from this, try to get your head around this multidimensional space because what you thought you knew about distance does not apply inside of these models. Artificial intelligence has relationships that can be described mathematically but make literally no sense to us. And I say that because the entire history of evolution, of life on Earth, has taken place in a three-dimensional world. Up, down, forward, back, left, right, that's all our brains or any animal on the planet's brain can really handle because that's all it's ever known. So the asterisk, the caveat of thinking about this gigantic library is in your mind you probably kept imagining a three-dimensional library. I mean, it can be books up or down, but it can be books that are left or right, back and forth, but Actually, the way multi-dimensions work, they can be, in mathematical terms, adjacent to one another or orthogonal to one another, but it's not just the three dimensions of space that we're navigating anymore. And remember, this is just a descriptor. It's not like some, something like actually is more multi-dimensional inside of uh, one of these systems. I mean, it's still just a computer or our brains are still existing in three dimensions. But what I mean by it is the mathematical description of where something is in three dimensions, which is really what the computer is looking at. So if we take a vector, so just a list of numbers, and you describe length, width, and height, you can say where on a cube or where inside of a cube a certain point is. Then another list of three would describe the next dot. And then you could use vector mathematics to measure the distance between the two dots, but we're still in three dimensions right now. There's nothing stopping us from just adding another number to the list. And all of a sudden now, we have a four-dimensional space. The objects can work essentially the same way. You can still use vector mathematics, but now it's like kind of broken in our head. Hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, it doesn't matter. But as you keep adding them, the notion, the intuitive notion of where things are grouped and the distance they are from other things just becomes so... There's so much to it, all of a sudden the magic starts happening. I can only imagine it as basic trigonometry, but there's something about just these groups and the way that you can move between dimensions where something to us feels like it's far away from something else, but if you were like kind of to twist dimensions or whatever, they might be closer in some sense, and this is where all these crazy relationships are actually coming from inside of chat GPT. However, in the context of artificial intelligence or data, we only add a number to this list a dimension to the information when we consider it to be what's called a feature. You call it a feature or an attribute of the data, but what it is is it's like sort of a pattern, like something that you would notice in all of the images because there's something sort of common if you're doing image analysis. Or if it's words, it would be the placement of the word the or is. There's some sort of relationship that becomes extremely 
popular or abundant in a data source, and then we usually compress that down into a feature so the map has the most description possible without taking up so many more dimensions than we need. Imagine we start describing a house by something that we would call a feature, something like price, size, the number of bedrooms, the location, the age, these sort of commonalities that you would find in all houses. So you could consider each of these attributes as one of the dimensions in your magical map. Sometimes data scientists use special algorithms to help figure out what these features are in the first place, or sometimes they just hand code them in. So if we're gonna model this house, and we actually did make these up, we decided that these were the features we wanted, you would be describing all of the houses that are in the overall data population in an artificial intelligence model in five dimensions. It's just that what to us is like up or down is actually gonna be in this model, the size of the house getting bigger or smaller. And forward and back might be the age of the house. So you can navigate along all these different dimensions, all these different axes. And you can just keep doing this. In fact, any given sufficiently useful model is going to have so many dimensions it will blow your mind. For example, a simple image, a colored image like a JPEG that you might get text message to you. That's only 100 by 100 pixels. That picture in its full context, not an AI model that's like a map of it, but the full thing would have 30,000 dimensions. 100 for height, 100 for width, and three for the RGB color scheme that describe the colors in the image. You multiply that all out and you get 30,000 dimensions. So now you could take a million photographs, just make sure they're all done with RGB for the color description and they're all 100 by 100 pixels. You could have a machine learning model learn from them all and now you have something that you can essentially ask a question to. You have a map now of all of the things that it's learned and across all the real images that it was trained on, that it observed, it will now have patterns built into the map that are super useful. Now, of course, a map like this is a boon, but it's also a big challenge if we're actually gonna try to figure out how to build these things in the first place. It's one of the reasons why it's taken so long for the field of AI to progress to a point now where we see it in all of our everyday tools. Because as you add each dimension, like you saw the 100 by 100 pixels, if you now make that 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, the actual amount of dimensions just blows up to a place where it's sort of uncomputable for a supercomputer. Information becomes harder to find, data becomes sparse, the learning algorithms need way more data to fill in all those dimensions with anything useful, which refers to a frustrating phenomenon that has limited artificial intelligence for a long time and is perfectly illustrated on my shirt actually called the curse of dimensionality. But as the field of AI has advanced, we have come up with better and better solutions to handle this. So a bunch of mathematical techniques that are meant for dimensionality reduction. So how do you bring down the dimensions, keep the relevant information so you have features that can be navigated and you can actually use these things. That vast library that's too big to navigate. You have to still get a map that somehow has learned from that entire library, but it has the right relationships for you to find what you need. Actually, instead of saying find what you need, I should say have learned because it's going to give you something that is not a find. It's not finding the book in the library. It learned from all of the library, what's in the library, and now you're asking it a question from this map, and the map is giving you an answer, but the answer is actually, in a sense, unique. It just learned from the full library. So there's a bunch of these techniques, and I feel like this video is already super complicated, so I won't explore that space too much, but I'm gonna give you a toy example, one of the simplest and most useful dimensionality reduction algorithms called T-SNE. Excuse me, a chew? No, t dash. SNE. Technically, it stands for the T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. Nobody really needs to know that. Just know that's one algorithm that's really popular. It's good for taking this curse of dimensionality, compressing it down to something useful in some much smaller amount of dimensions. For example, if you've used Meta's new Llama 2 training model, it was given every single piece of word on the entire internet. That's that unmanageable library that we talked about. And as it was reading the internet, it thought about each part of the internet in a word fragment called a token. You can think of it like a single word. Sometimes there's more more or less letters in there. But we could imagine that in our library as the books. So the library is everything on the internet. The books are the little tokens, the little chunks of the internet that it made. And our map is made from this magical dimensionality reduction algorithm, TSNE, which zipped around the entire library, the entire internet at great speed, at great cost. This is why it costs sometimes over a hundred million dollars to train one of these advanced LLM models. And it gave us a map with less dimensions, but it has captured really important features 
parameters of the data, the patterns that were out there in the full library. And now when you actually sit down and ask a tool like Llama or ChatGPT a question, it takes the words that you enter, it turns them into those same little token fragments, it turns it into those little books, it asks the map, here's what this combination of all these things look like, and then word by word, it just goes and finds up and down, zigging and zagging up and down all of these different features and all these different dimensions, whatever word is mathematically corresponding to what you put in each token at a time, book by book. And for no particular reason that you can just say this is why, it ends up just doing super magical things. There's just important patterns in there, but it doesn't mean the people at OpenAI or Google or Microsoft exactly know what those patterns are. In fact, the whole branch of artificial intelligence called explainable AI is about trying to figure that out. There's little, little clues. There's a few things I could say about that, but infancy in terms of how we understand it. But for the thought experiment, maybe the concept that we have in our world of cold and hot is in there somewhere. Maybe there's a feature that's for cold or hot. So imagine your Cartesian coordinate system and imagine going down the X access and as you do that everything goes from cold to hot like these word fragments so just books and words in our metaphor that are like ice cubes and igloos and mittens and stuff are down here and then just slowly as you move along that axis you get cactus and other like sand and deserts and all that sort of stuff now let's say the y-axis is like vacations or something so as you think about work environments versus vacation environments and you're thinking about hot and cold everything's changing you know like if you move up this axis where you're on vacation then all of a sudden cold and hot is going on a ski vacation or going to a beach but then if you go down that axis back to work now maybe you find words like like hot coffee or cold attitudes or something. It's just crazy to kind of think about how it's working in there, but it's beyond comprehension. But the concept of latent space is a testament to how artificial intelligence is going to shape the future. It's a completely new way to think about things. It's not a program, even though it feels like it might be because it runs on servers or on computers, but we really should get our head around just how different artificial intelligence is. And these magical maps like Llama 2 and 3 and GPT-3 and 4 and whatever comes next are truly magical. They're important, they're useful, they're going to shape our future in ways that we can't imagine. And if that becomes highly accurate, we could, in theory, lose our sense of free will as AI of the future could accurately predict everything that we're going to think and do. And in fact, maybe this concept of latent space will eventually unwrap the mysteries of the subscribe button.